Today's guest is Damon Sanun Tanasic. I asked him and I hope I said his last name right. Let me tell you about Damon. Um, he actually got his MBA from the University of Cambridge in England. He's the CEO of Natural Cure Labs. Um, they are switching to Palmera Health. And what we're talking about today is monolaurin. So MCTs, do you know what MCT oil is? Have you heard of this? Medium change regular try glycerides. If you're in the keto space, I'm sure you have, if not, you may have. Well, monolaurin comes from lauric acid, which is C12, right? So if this is new to you, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but if you know MCTs, you probably usually use like a C8 or maybe something with, you know, a little bit of C10 in it. C12, we're talking about C12 today, lauric acid, which I start off the episode talking about how it kind of got like a bad name because Dave Asprey didn't put it in his um, MCT oil. And so we kind of dive into that a little bit. Lauric acid is definitely not bad for you. He's going to tell you a little bit about more about what it is. And monolaurin is made from lauric acid and it has some really cool health benefits, which you can see in the episode, Damon has to be careful, you know, because he has a supplement product with this in it. They, they're limited on what they can say. So I kind of took the boat there, <laughs> but basically um, it has antiviral antimicrobial properties to it. So it's, it's, you can look at it as an immune booster. You can also find it naturally in coconut oil palm kernel oil. Um, but we're as, you know, in the biohacking realm or the health optimization realm, I guess we could call it. We, sometimes you want bigger doses of certain things without having to have all the other stuff. Right. So we'll dive into some of those benefits. And, um, he also, what I love about this episode is Damon educates you basically on how supplement the supplement industry works, which is really nice to know. Um, and what I mean by that is he's talking about like different choices they make along the path of providing supplements where quality testing comes in and how you can kind of look for that on your packaging, what to look for, what kind of processing agents people use, you know, is it lab tested? Can you see that on the bottle? He goes through a whole educational process on that towards the end of the episode that I really appreciate, but yeah, Mono Lauren is cool. I hope you guys, um, check it out. And he, if you want to get theirs, which is like, it's really good stuff. He, they did offer you a 10% off coupon with coupon code coach Tara, which is the one that I usually use. So 10% off. And that's at naturalcurelabs.com. And, um, we'll link that in the show notes. So you can find it. If you want to try out mono Lauren after you listen to this. All right. Hope you enjoy nerding out. Here is Damon. Oh boy, guys. So none so none to Nasek. I think I got that right. <laughs> all right. All right, Damon, thank you for coming and joining me today. Talking all about Mono Lauren. Uh, we talked a little bit before we started about carbon chains, right? Okay, guys, don't get turned, don't get turned off just because I said carbon chains. Okay. It's like, we're going to, it's, we're going to break it down, but we were talking about how Back early in the keto days, <laughs> I remember, I remember when Dave Asprey came out with his, uh, C eight, you know, most of these MCT oils that people put in their coffees and stuff, they kind of do the, the eight that in case you guys didn't know that's standing for eight carbons in a chain, right. As MCT oil. And I, and he said that he didn't have C 12 or lauric acid in his uh, MCT oil. And I think a lot of people just got this idea that lauric acid was bad for you. And Dave himself has said, no, 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 it's not bad for you. It's one, it's really bitter. <laughs> and two, um, and that, I mean, I'm assuming that's probably why he didn't put it in there. And um, the shorter the carbon chains, the quicker they turn into ketones, right? So it's a different purpose, but C12 or lauric acid, which you guys have, I, I, I'll ask you, you can tell us, I think you turn it into monolaurin, right? It's like a chemical process but it has insane health benefits. So I was wondering if you could start off by just a little bit of like the history discovery, what it is, what is mono Lauren? Yeah. Happy to help Tara. And thanks so much for having me today. Look, you, you hit on um, a lot of great points and let's, let's unpack them one by one. So uh, mono Lauren has been around for quite some time since around the 1960s, I believe it was originally isolated when scientists were um, investigating the composition of breast milk. At the time, they were asking, hmm, how is it that an infant, which is born with, with few um, uh, antibodies and a relatively weak immune system, how are infants not habitually getting sick? Yeah. And uh, in the analysis of uh, breast milk, they discovered that um, around 6.5% of breast milk is lauric acid. And so that's what sort of got a, a lot of the research kicked off um, cool. you know, several decades ago. And it turns out that... Um, Lauric acid exists in, in nature and in, in plant material, including 
um, co um, sorry, palm kernel oils and also coconut oil. So coconut oil is around 90% saturated fats and yeah. over 50% of those fats are medium chain fatty acids, such as lauric acid. And as you correctly pointed out, lauric acid is a 12 carbon atom chain fatty acid. And uh, it's the basis of what monolaurin is made from, right? So when you yeah. ingest uh, lauric acid, your body converts it to monolaurin. Okay. And monolaurin has a lot of those health benefits that have been uh, expressed in several uh, publicly uh, produced and peer-reviewed research studies. And the challenge here is that it is unknown currently the uh, rate of, of uh, translation between lauric acid and monolaurin. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the popularization of monolaurin as a supplement has grown because uh, you could uh, hypothetically ingest an enormous amount of coconut oil with, like I said, 50% of the fatty acids in coconut oil being lauric acid, but um, you'd have to ingest quite a bit to, in order to sort of get to some sort of therapeutic level of monolaurin. Uh, by our calculations, right. you know, to equivalent to one 600 milligram capsule of monolaurin, you need to take around six and a half teaspoons of coconut oil. Okay. So that's making assumptions that coconut oil is, you know, a certain number of you know, cubic or grams per cubic centimeter and right. milligrams, it's, it's things are perfectly like. standardized all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Whether it's raw or processed, et cetera, right. et cetera. But at the end of the day, uh, an average person may assume, may consume six, 600 milligram capsules, two with breakfast, two with lunch, two with dinner. And in order to get that amount via coconut oil, you may need to take around one cup of coconut <laughs> oil a day, which for some people may be, you know, a little bit inconvenient. Some for some others may be unpleasant, but it's- I just it's hear diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of MCTs. <laughs> totally. Okay. So what are some of these benefits that research is uh, pointing out around monolaurin? Yeah, well, you have to go back to like it's monolaurin's commercial application to sort of derive some of the, those benefits. Uh, like I said, monolaurin was discovered in the 60s and it's been uh, on the FDA's GRASS list for quite some time. GRASS is an acronym, which stands for generally recognized as safe. So it's used in a lot of food production and in commercial applications. So in food, it's used as um, like a shelf stabilizer for things like ice cream and pastas. It's also mm. used in the cosmetic industry as, uh, oh. as an emulsifier and surfactant. And uh, it's used in things like commercial uh, processing plants. Like, so for example, if it's a meat processing plant and they want to stay as natural and organic as possible, mm -hmm. well, then maybe they'll substitute monolaurin to, to clean flat surfaces in place mm. of a harsh chemical, for example. Wow. And of course, uh, it's used in dietary supplements, um, which is probably the, the main focus of our conversation today. Now, you know, monolaurin is taken as a dietary supplement for its purported uh, immune uh, modulating or immune uh, supporting um, effects. But yeah. as a representative of, of uh, a supplement company that's doing their best to uh, stay as compliant as possible. There's a lot of things we can't explicitly say, mm. but what we can do is help listeners seek out where to find information and to do yeah. their own research. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> you shouldn't tune into a podcast and listen to someone like me and, and yeah. take your, your health advice from someone who, who may have um, an agenda. You should absolutely you know, seek yeah. out you know, the research and become uh, you know, self-educated and feel really great about the, the, um, and the supplements that you're putting into your body. And also caveat that supplements, um, you know, by the nature of, of the category that they are meant to supplement your yes. health routines, right? Nothing is meant to be a, a magic bullet. No right. one single pill is out to cure anything, right? right? It's, it's a series of, of decisions that an individual has to make, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, which takes into account eating right, getting right exercise, sleeping, mental health, it's all part of the package, yes. right? And yes. for some people, supplements may be a part of that package. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that so much. I get this question all the time. What supplements should I take? <laughs> and I'm just like, I don't know. Have you run any tests? Have you tried any, you know, like there's so much we can find out. And I'm like, I'll be, people are like, well, what do you take? I'm like, I have like hundreds of supplements because, and I don't take all of those every day, obviously, but I'm always experimenting. I'm always trying things out. And I always say, I love to be 
ridiculously curious and super skeptical of everything. It's just like, it's just, that's part of being open is like, okay, what is the benefit of this thing? Does that sound interesting to me? Does it sound like something I need? Let me try it out and see how it goes. And the story period is kind of, it's pretty easy, you know? So, I okay. And I, I totally understand that you guys can't be like, it does everything, you know, like <laughs> it's kind of funny. You know, you hear these things like from a lot of, um, uh, vitamins, minerals, any, anything like that. it's like, it, uh, reduces risk of cancer. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah. Cause like everything that makes you healthier reduces risk of cancer, you know? So I understand that, you know, with supplement companies, they can be a little bit like, you can't say this, you can't say that, but if someone were to want to do their own research, what are some things that they might want to look up? <laughs> That's a perfect segue. Thanks so much. And thanks for your <laughs> flexibility, and understanding it. I'm not deliberately being coy or, or avoiding no, I get it. <laughs> really just trying to be as compliant as possible yes. here. Um, so great question. How do we, so I love it. You'll be as curious as possible, but also be as skeptical as possible. So uh, there are a couple uh, paths I might recommend to seeking out information. So the first path is there's a government website called PubMed. It's uh, run by the National Institutes of Health. It's been around forever and, and it has hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of peer reviewed yeah. academic and scholarly articles. And these are like the gold standard research papers, the ones that are right. multi-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled types of studies, right? So really, really interesting stuff there. And the great thing about PubMed and NCBI is that um, it works just like Google. Like you, you go to the PubMed website, yeah. there's a search bar, you type in monolaurin plus whatever modifying word, noun or verb you, you'd like to learn more about, whether it's around gut health, whether it's around... Um, biofilms, yeast yeah. overgrowths, um, you know, any, any type of uh, immune compromise you can think of, you might want to add that to uh, the search. And what's really cool about it is it'll pull out and surface for the, the user um, a series of results that take monolaurin or lauric acid or glycerol monolaurate. You may have to sort of play with the scientific terms there because it is a research database. Yeah. Plus the modifying you know words that you've added and give you exactly what you know the results you you're you're looking for. Now, a word of caution is that you know because it is a research database, you're going to get research articles, and these aren't really yeah. the friendliest written articles, right? They're, right? they're pretty dense with with Latin sounding terms and right. <laughs> formulas and equations. So uh, there are other ways to seek out information. One website which is particularly interesting is called monolaurinandmore.com. And uh, what this website has done, um, it's an independent third-party website. They don't advertise a particular product. They don't have any branding nice. or anything. Um, but what it does is it distills a lot of those articles and turns it yeah. into very user-friendly, short format um, posts, right? Yes. And within these posts, they have um, verbatim, like little sound bites from the actual uh, research articles accompanied by the references. So you can go perform yeah. your own research and double check to make sure that they're not fibbing, right? right. And what I love about this is it's categorized into very specific um, health uh, groupings, right? Yeah. So just looking at the the website, Monolaurin and more, if you go to the health articles website, they have all these topics and the topics range from Lyme disease to bacterial yeah. infections to Epstein Barr virus to uh, you know viral infections. It's the the research is pretty far reaching. Yeah. And um, what's again what's nice about it is that it's really condensed. It's sort of brought down to a, a level where uh, anyone can ac access it, and uh, it can be pretty informative. Well, I'm looking at it right now and I, like, I'll say some of the stuff it says, I don't know if you can, but I can, I, I, I find this fascinating. Um, they have on there, the monolore top 10, right. And it, you're right. It's very like, if you want the rundown, it's, it's nice. Cause they're all referenced and it breaks it down. Right. And this, I mean, I think this is really interesting, the research on viruses, so it's saying that the it's such the studies are suggesting that they monolaurin has the ability to inactivate a number of RNA DNA and RNA enveloped viruses purportedly by breaking down the outer lipid membrane and destroying the virus and there's a whole bunch of info here on 
um, HSV, herpes simplex one, herpes simplex two, measles, you know, Epstein bar. That's fascinating, right? And that you're right. That's a really nice. I love that it's third party. And then you can just go click on those studies if you're interested in that thing, <laughs> which is really nice. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, look, I, I I wish I could quote the studies. I wish I could scream. Yeah. Really tough, but, uh, again, trying to be as as careful about what we say here, but again, you know seek out the research. Google Scholar is another great uh, resource tool. It's a little bit broader reaching than NCBI PubMed. Functions the same way as normal Google, right? You go to Google Scholar, yeah, you punch right. in Mono Learn and whatever you want to learn about, and it'll return some pretty interesting information. Yeah. I mean, it's really cool. I love going back to how you, you started off the, the podcast about babies not getting, getting sick. You know, I mean, 6% of breast milk is pretty high. You know, I can definitely understand why that got their attention. And I love that this is from nature, which I'm all about all my biohacks and everything. I'm like, that's cool. You can spend a bunch of money on like, you know, sound wave stuff and light therapies. And I like that stuff too, you know, but if like anything that's coming from food (laughs) that was already on the earth, just ready to go for us, you know, and we can see that this is being converted in the body, like, especially in breast milk for babies. Like that's very interesting to me, you know? So, uh, yeah, Yeah, Uh, I love that. Another interesting article on that same website that you're taking a look at right now around monolaurin and breast milk and the studies, um, uh, lauric acid, I should say, in breast milk and the studies. Uh, which support right, it. right. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's around six and a half percent on average. But what's fascinating is it can be um, sort of modulated depending on several external factors. Some of them are not within your control, like your age, you know, your ethnicity, the region in which you live and things of that nature. But things like food consumption, like what you eat can affect the levels of monolaurin in the body and, and the breast milk. And um, right. it's really, really like the the studies are fascinating and ones which I encourage folks to seek out and, and learn a little bit more on. Yeah. I, well, I'm going to list a few for you guys here. Cause I can say whatever I want. Um, <laughs> at least I think I can, I sure act like I can. Um, you know, there's some research studies here on, you know, even chlamydia, E. coli, H. pylori, candida, uh, Giardia, like there's biofilms. There's a lot of really interesting stuff. So I'm just throwing it out there. If you guys want to look into it, those are some of the things that are being listed here that they have lots of, uh, cited research studies to look into. Right. So that's pretty cool. Um, keto let's talk about keto. Why would keto people be interested in this? Well, because monolaurin is a medium chain fatty acid, which comes from a plant-based source, it is completely keto friendly, right? Yeah. And, um, it can be integrated into a keto diet. It, um, you know, it may help produce some of the, uh, the related benefits that come with a keto diet, like hunger suppression and, you know, potential, you know, reduction in, in body fats and things of that nature. Yeah. And, um, monolaurin will not sort of, you know, take away or imbalance and what, what individuals may be working towards when, when trying to reach a state of ketosis. Yeah. I, when I was writing my book, um, short-term keto, I was looking at, um, MCTs and some studies that people have done of like literally eating quote unquote, more calories with MCTs, but losing more body fat, right. They're converted to ketones in the liver. And I don't think we know completely why that happens, but I find that fascinating that that happens that you're like, quote unquote, eating more cut cal- because, it's hard to kind of look at MCTs as calories to me because they're converted in the liver into ketones, this energy source. I just don't see how they would be uh, stored as body fat in my opinion. (laughs) So I think that's pretty cool too. Like it it does help with energy expenditure. It helps with mental clarity. It helps with, you know, I'm just talking about MCTs in general help with all of these things. So yeah, I mean, if you're keto, this, I, for my opinion, it would be definitely something to look into to help along that journey. Cause a lot of people who are doing keto, they're doing it as like a healing metabolic healing diet too. Right. So this is like a healing part from nature. I think it's worth a a dive into. Um, I wanted to ask you like supplements, you know, it's, I, so I've been in the supplement world. I formulated some supplements. I actually was starting a supplement company at one time. So I'm I'm, I'm not a, uh, I'm not naive when it comes to the (laughs) the supplement world and what happens in the background. And it's like, okay, 
well, you could have this supplement that says it's this, but the way it's manufactured, it's cheap crap. Like it's, you know, there's a reason that multivitamin is $8 and that other one is 60. There's a reason. <laughs> so Completely. are all, uh, monolaurins, like, is there a big discrepancy on how they're formulated and made? Great question. Yeah. And awesome observation. I love speaking to folks that you know, have an appreciation for the industry because uh, it is a little bit behind the curtain, you know, how yeah. some of these supplements are created. And at the end of the day, no supplement is sort of created equal, you know, model Lauren included. And so there's a few things that you, well, any average consumer would would potentially uh, pay attention to when seeking out a model Lauren supplement, if that's what they choose to, to do, right? Mm -hmm. The first thing that's the most obvious maybe is uh, the source of monolaurin. As we said, you know, monolaurin really comes from three main, main sources. Uh, it, it's found in breast milk, it's found in palm kernel oil, and it's found in coconut oil. And uh, unless the bottle explicitly says the source, it's probably from palm kernel because that's the more readily available and, and more economically uh, feasible source of, of, of the lauric acid. Now we choose um, to not use palm kernel oil uh, because not necessarily because it's like the less potent or inferior yeah. version of lauric acid because like there are secondary effects that we just don't agree with. So palm kernel oils um, harvesting can contribute to the loss of, of yeah. uh, sensitive, you know, economic, or I'm yep. sorry, uh, ecological yes. um, uh, spaces in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia and Sri Lanka yes. and India and other, other places like that. And, and sort of the displacement of, of native uh, fauna, like the yeah. orangutan, which is endangered, yes. right? Yes. So, yeah. I, I just want to pause you right there if that's okay. Like, I just want to clear that up for people. Cause I get this a lot. Like is palm oil bad for you? No, it's not bad for you at all. It, that's not the problem. It's exactly what you're talking about here. And that's why we kind of avoid it because it's just harvest. They're killing the orangutans. Okay. People, but there's, yeah, there's, uh, there's, um, ecological consequences for it. So just something to know in case you guys didn't know that. So I appreciate you guys pushing more for, I'm assuming I'll let you finish, but coconut is coconut where you source, source yours. Where, okay. where we prefer. <laughs> exactly. So we definitely prefer a coconut source. Um, and that's the most obvious path, but there are several, um, considerations that may not be as obvious. Another one is uh, something called an excipient. And as someone who's who's familiar with the space, uh, you may know that excipient is also known as a flow agent, um, also known as um, like a lubricant. So with high speed encapsulation equipment, you're rapidly filling thousands of capsules a minute, right? And in order yeah. to ensure a uniform fill, an excipient is required as an essential part of the manufacturing process. And an excipient ensures that as the powder or the product is being put into the capsule, it's being put in the same every time. Because if the bottle says 600 milligrams, you really want 600 yeah. milligrams in that capsule, right? And a lot of manufacturing uh, companies and brands will use a synthetic or artificial or cheaper excipient, which may mean they use magnesium stearate or silica or another artificial ingredient. Uh -huh. Now, the challenge with that is uh, twofold. One is that uh, some studies suggest it may slow the absorption of the actual vitamin or mineral or product yeah. that you're trying to take in. And other su studies suggest that it may uh, lead to digestive issues like stomach upset or things of that nature. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to switch the excipient out from a synthetic source to a natural one. The natural one that we that we use are, is uh, organic rice powder, right? It has the same you know, flow effect mm -hmm. without a lot of the the undesirable side effects. Nice. Um, another, you know, consideration may be around like how you uh, like the, uh, take monolaurin. Basically, the the format in which monolaurin comes in, and really it comes in like three principal formats. One is like a, just a bulk powder, right? I know right. plenty of people who really enjoy, um, you know, sort of filling and combining their own products to, to make their own capsules at home. And that's a totally lots of respect for the patients uh, <laughs> the, and discipline these folks have, but uh, others may choose uh, bulk powder because maybe they want to put it in some applesauce to take it, you know, without having to swallow a capsule or with some pudding or in a, a shake or something like that really, really not recommended here. <laughs> Monolaurin by nature is so bitter, so yes. soapy, so sticky, that it really coats the mouth and you can't get it out. I've, I've had, I've had raw monolaurin so many times and like 
yeah. I still get like some ghost pains. Yeah, I can sense the like little bit of trauma response. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So bulk powder is not really the most popular. So it really comes down to two other uh, delivery formats. One is um, a pill. I'm sorry, um, a pellet. So these pellets are really, really interesting. They're a, fa- they're a fascinating and, and very economical way to get a lot of monolaurin in one go. One scoop, I think, is something like upwards of three grams or, or wow. more of, of monolaurin. The challenge with these pellets um, is that they're encapsulated in these, in this, like I think it's glycerol. And, um, you know, for some individuals, uh, you know, either A, if you read the reviews, uh, a lot of people complain that, you know, they find the monolaurin pellets like in the toilet a few hours later. So it's like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, like I thought I was getting three grams, but how much of that did I really absorb versus right. how much got passed straight through? For other folks, it may be that the the sort of the glycerol um, uh, coating, so there are these like tiny little BB sized teardrop shaped pellets, um, it may lead to like stomach upset. Yeah. And for other reasons, you know, they're just not as convenient. They don't really fit well into pill organizers. You can't really put a handful in your purse and take it with you on a trip or whatever it may be. Right. So you know, the format we we gravitate to and one that we prefer is capsules, right? Capsules can come in a couple formats. They can either be from animal gelatin. And for people who are sensitive to that, they can also come in the vegan plant cellulose capsule, and which is what we use. And then, you know, of course you should look for, you know, turn the bottle around, look for the supplement facts panel and right underneath that, you can see the other ingredients section, which yeah. will help you understand, okay, is it a animal or, or vegan capsule? And is the excipient, that flow agent we talked about, is that a synthetic one or is it a natural one? Yeah. And, you know, other things to keep in mind to, to, your, to your point earlier around like, hey, do some people cut corners? Like what's really happening behind that manufacturing process? Um, you know, look on the company's website or on the bottle. It, ideally, it'll say something like, you know, manufactured in a, in a GMP certified facility. GMP stands for a like good manufacturing process. It's an official certification. It's an accreditation that's issued either by uh, you know, accre- accrediting companies like UL or NSF. And that just basically means that you're following safety and hygienic and quality yeah. controls, right? Which is really, really important when you're putting something in your body, yes. right? Uh, are are the ingredients U.S. source? Is it made in, in the U.S.? Is it made in the FDA inspected facility? These are all these little things you can sort of yeah. sort of tune into to see if the company is is doing the right thing and following all the rules. One yeah, I appreciate. Thing, oh, oh, I was just gonna say I appreciate knowing this too because like we can apply this to lots of supplements, so it's just good uh, knowledge to have in general of things to look for because you know when you see that organic rice powder, you're like, ah, okay, they're a little bit more committed to natural. Got it. You know. These little ticks. Okay, sorry. What was your last thing? <laughs> uh, you're totally right, and and you're you're thinking about it in all the right ways. I was just going to sneak in one last thing, um, one which we've made a lot of investments into is around uh, testing, and the testing of the product. Right. So, nice. uh, you want to make sure that you know what's in the capsule um, is what the bottle suggests it is, and that means by weight, by fill, by an assay, which is basically to say like, you know, does the ca- the composition, the you know, sort of the the, the chemical composition match when the bottle suggests it is? And does it have like the appropriate amount of studies uh, backing up the shelf life and its potency nice. and, and uh, you know, how long it's, it can safely live on a shelf. So all those things like really, really lead into like, okay, this is like a compliant, serious yeah. company versus one that may be looking to save some cost. Yeah, that's huge. And I can definitely say like, I've, come across that. And it, it, you know, there's, there's, there are, I just be real. Like if you're going to go on Amazon and buy the cheapest supplement that you can find, like, it's not going to be what you just described. It's going to be like, where can I buy some bolt cheap, crap from China and encapsulate it for as cheap as possible and sell it on the online and make a bunch of money. There's a lot, just so you guys know, like <laughs> that is what, I mean, I won't make you say, but it's very common. <laughs> it's common, you know? And so it's sup- the supplement world is always, you get what you pay for. It just is because everybody, every supplement company has the opportunity to go the cheap route. It's like, what you going to do here? Are you going to try to make it as cheap as possible and have huge margins and become filthy rich? Ha 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 ha. Everybody has that opportunity. They can go that way if they want to. And so I appreciate companies like you guys that are like, no, we're not doing that. 
<laughs> we respect ourselves and people and, you know, health, human health, and we are going to do create something that's amazing. So thank you for describing that. Honestly, that was like a really great educational session for just the supplement industry in general. Um, and that's, yeah, it's really awesome when people go the extra mile to have things tested, you know, it's just like, we just want to make sure that, you know, and we want to know that our stuff is good, you know? So I really respect that from a business perspective as well. Um, okay. So dosing, you mentioned this like three gram thing, how much should people, you know, what, what, what's the recommended dosage range? Great question. And I, I you know, you, you mentioned something earlier, not, not explicitly, I don't think, but, uh, you know, oh, around your curiosity, right. Yeah. Around being uh, curious and skeptical. Well, um, everyone needs to sort of listen to their body. So that's the first, the first thing I should say is like, look, like any supplement, it should you know, monolaurin should be taken under the supervision of a healthcare a professional, a practitioner, GP, naturopath, et cetera. So I want to be, be pretty explicit about that. But also the second thing is like, to your point, it's like, look, you should, you know, listen to your body and, and see how you react to any new supplement because, um, yeah. Um, it can depend on your sort of genetic makeup, your age, totally. your health, your, your, your gender, your weight, et cetera, et cetera, dietary or lifestyle choices all influence right. your reaction to, to supplementation. So, uh, you know, being really tuned into that, I think is pretty, pretty key, but look, there are three, there are three main, um, approaches to dosing. Uh, the first one being like starting monolaurin, I guess any supplement uh, for the first time and sort of not knowing how you're going to react to it. And with monolaurin specifically, there's a industry phrase of like this low and slow methodology, right? Which is, as it suggests, you start with a low dose, maybe one capsule every, once a day or every couple of days, and you slowly increase it over the course of a few weeks to get up to a dose that you feel most comfortable with. And why might you do that? Well, there's this phenomenon called a Herxheimer reaction. And uh, for those of your listeners who aren't familiar with the Herxheimer reaction, it's also known as a die-off reaction. And it's this peculiar um, phenomenon that happens with the rapid die-off of a pathogen in the body. So you could take an antibiotic, for example, and have this, this reaction. And what happens is when a pathogen rapidly dies off, it releases these protein endotoxins into the blood system which your body sort of reacts to, has an um, inflammatory response to try to go scoop up and clean up all those protein endotoxins which are circulating in the blood. And that inflammatory response has this like ironic um, symptoms of like a cold or a flu. You know, you may have body aches, you have a low grade fever, you know, you may have congestion or whatever it may be. And why it's ironic is it's like, well, technically you're getting better because you're killing a bug off, but you feel a lot worse, right? Yeah. And so the thought process here is to avoid a die-off reaction or a Herxheimer reaction, you would want to start super low and increase it over time, right? So that's the, the first consideration and approach for, as it relates yeah. to dosing. The second uh, consideration or approach is just like a daily multivitamin, like a daily driver, right? Like many mm -hmm. people will take vitamin D or vitamin C or a multivitamin right. every day. Well, plenty of people take monolaurin every day uh, to support and maintain immune health. As I mentioned earlier, monolaurin is, is grass listed, so generally recognized as safe. It has, as far as my research indicates, I don't think it has like a, a limit as, as to how long you can take it. Or um, there, I don't think there's even upper thresholds to how much you could or should take. So it's mm. relatively safe. It's naturally occurring. And so many right. people do choose to take it every day to support and maintain overall immune health. Yeah. Um, the third consideration, the third approach is when you're sort of maybe immunocompromised, like when, let's say you're getting on a transatlantic flight and you're feeling super run down, right. uh, you know, you may choose to increase your vitamin C to try to give your body a little bit right. of a boost. Well, maybe you do the same with monolaurin. And, uh, so if you're sort of responding to something, some externality or, or maybe some, you know, some additional pressure on your immune system, you may choose to increase, um, you know, monolaurin or any other you know, supplement to help support your immune system. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that question. Like, cause I know like sometimes when you give people, <laughs> I used to like always want to make memes about like what happens when you take too much MCT oil at once. Right. Like, so with MCT oil, those of you who have, you know, <laughs> 
experimented with this, you know that you can get like loose stools if you do too much MCT oil. Does that happen with monolaurin at all? If you take high doses? That, that you, yeah. I personally, I don't, I don't, okay. I don't have familiarity with that, but uh, okay. gosh, monolaurin is a medium chain fatty acid and, but you haven't run into that. So that's good to know. Okay. Well, I guess I can always find out. We talked about experimenting. You always find out the hard way one time. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. But it sounds like probably not, or you'd probably be really familiar with that. So that's good to know. Um, all right. So where, where can we direct people again? You gave us the mono Lauren and more, and I'll link these in the show notes, but where else, you know, where can we find your products? You know, what, what else can we, people partake of if they want to learn more or try it out? Yeah. Thanks for asking again, just to reiterate, um, you know, personal health is, um, a series of personal decisions and, and yeah. research and, and it's a combination of factors that include, as we indicated, you know, lifestyle choices like eating, exercise, sleeping, mental health, and uh, supplements are just one part of that overall approach. And, uh, you know, before anyone uh, starts a supplement routine, do the research. We mentioned yes. monolaurin and more. Yeah. .com. We mentioned uh, PubMed. You can just Google PubMed, it'll pop up. And of course, Google Scholar to do that research, to really understand the product or the you know, the supplement, understand how it's used, how, you know, what the research is indicating before you jump right into it, right? But if you do come to the conclusion that you want to try out monolaurin, um, our website is naturalcurelabs.com. Uh, so that'll bring you to our, our, our website and you can find our three monolaurin products there. We have a 600 milligram variant, an 800 milligram variant, and a combination product, which is monolaurin and lysine. And uh, we're in the process actually of... Um, of a brand change. So uh, our, we're doing it very slowly, very deliberately as to not um, you know, cause too much disruption with our customers and perception. But I, I, I promise you it's the same manufacturing uh, you know, facilities, same, same laboratories we use, same ingredients, just a different name. Mm -hmm. uh, but the new name is Palmera Health. That's okay. P-A-L-M-A-R-A -A Health. And uh, we just love the new name. It's it's better reflective of our, our company's mission and vision and values. And the way we came to the name, Palmara, is uh, it's derived from an uh, ancient Roman word, palmarius, which means deserving of the palm. And we love like the sort of the metaphor that comes out of this. Yeah. One is because coconuts come from palm trees. So how cool is that? Yeah, yeah. But secondarily is uh, a palm palm branch, a palm frond was given out as a, as a prize to the victor in ancient Roman competition. Mm. Um, and so the word, word palmarius and by turn palmara is meant to mean something or someone extraordinary. And we love just it. love that, that metaphor. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's it. Naturalcurelabs.com or palmarahealth.com. You, you can find us. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. We will link that all in the show notes and just want to thank you for, uh, being so mindful of the education process that's needed around supplementation. <laughs> you know, I appreciate you taking the time and coming out because yeah, like it's, I mean, as a health coach, it's often, there's a lot of education that needs to happen with people where they're like, you know, I'm like, where did you get your fish oil? Okay. Throw that one in the garbage. Like never take that again. Okay. <laughs> yes. Don't get your fish oil from Costco, you guys. Okay. So yeah. So I appreciate you giving us that, like the background education also just knowing about monolore. And I feel like it's like healing for everyone who uh, thought lauric acid was bad for them. <laughs> it's definitely not. And I always knew that it had like the antiviral antimicrobial benefits to it. So I was like, why are people avoiding this? Like, I definitely want that, you know? And so, and I love, you know, that you're, I, I hope you guys know that you guys that are listening, like sometimes it's really helpful if you want the benefit of one part of a plant to be able to get that in higher doses without having to eat so many of those plants when it's needed. It's, it's like, thank you. Thanks for taking that out and like putting it in higher doses so I can get those benefits when I need them without having to eat, eat a cup of coconut oil. So, <laughs> um, all right, we'll go ahead and wrap it up with that. With that. Thank you so much, Damon, for coming on and educating us today. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.